Well, good morning, Ebeth. Right now, Orlando police are focusing in on a house off of Roseboro Street, just a block north of where this police involved shooting happened around 2.30 this morning. Uh, still very heavy police presence out here in this area. Right now, Burton Boulevard is still blocked off as a SWAT team, K-9 units, multiple crews are there searching for these suspects. Again, there is just a very heavy police presence in this area on John Young Parkway on Columbia Street, right here where we're live on LB McLeod. Uh, officers out of their vehicles every two to 300 feet or so with their long rifles facing this very large perimeter. We're talking about a couple square miles where police are focusing on finding these two suspects. I spoke with uh, Chief Paul Rooney here this morning. He was here at the scene. He says around 2.30, a rookie officer was alone conducting a traffic stop when he says the two suspects got out of the car shot the officer at least once. He's 25 year old Jason Hajek and then they fled on foot. So right now uh, they're all searching this area. They're searching the first Baptist church here nearby businesses and a very large residential area. Listen to what the chief said about the search. Erica, good morning. Uh, just a few minutes ago, I spoke with a fire official here at the scene, and he tells me the good news is is that now they have the fire completely under control. But you can see in the distance, about a half a mile from where we are right now, some fire trucks still there, still uh, just keeping an eye in case any hot spots do pop up at the Blue Rhino propane gas plant right here in Tavares, about 40 miles north of Orlando. Now, this fire erupted around 1030 last night. Fire crews here at the scene tell me inside the plant there were 53,000 20 pound cylinders of propane gas, like the propane gas tanks you would put for a gas grill. And they tell you, they say that all of those uh, cylinders, they were scattered throughout the plant. So it made it very difficult for crews to fight that fire because it spread very quickly as the gas uh, tanks were spread throughout the entire area. Now, initially, there were report, reports that about 24 to 26 workers were here last night. Initially, 15 were unaccounted for. But the good news is, is that first responders have been able to locate everyone. As of now, there have been no casualties to report but seven people were injured. Take it to nearby hospitals. Take a listen to what uh, deputies with the Lake County Sheriff's Office had to say about finding those unaccounted for workers. I know it's New Year's Day and I want to find my brother, please. Amanda Goodwin and her family were hoping to ring in the new year with the good news that her brother, 30-year-old Jason Cobb, and his 26-year-old friend Charlie Jackson would be found safe. But after an exhaustive search spanning more than four days, still no sign of the two men. We are still doing um, recovery searching. We're, um, we've got a helicopter up there. We've got several boats out there um, running the waterways. Um, inspecting the shorelines, looking everywhere possible where we can find these um, these bodies. Around one o'clock Saturday morning, family says Jason and Charlie left the Black Hammock Fish Camp in Oviedo and took a small fishing boat out onto Lake Jessup, heading to Charlie's home in Deltona. But FWC says they never made it and were thrown from the vessel. Now, the boat was found in this area along the north shore of Lake Jessup and Florida Fish and Wildlife officials say they actually found two life jackets on board the boat. They're saying no matter what the circumstances are, it's always important to wear a life jacket. They were wearing their life jackets if they were ejected out of the vessel and on their way out, they you know hit their head, had some blunt trauma. They'd be floating right now. They may even be still alive, but it's hard to say if they were aware or were not wearing life jackets. Right now, no one knows exactly what happened to the two boaters, but family says they're not giving up hope that someone will find Jason and Charlie. I just want my brother home and Charlie. We need him home. Got to start the new year out good, so. From Oviedo and Seminole County, I'm Natalie Tolomeo, News 13. Shined up and ready to go outside of Orange County Fire Station 73 in Taft, it's Bariatric 1. From the outside, it's your average ambulance, but inside, so now anything you but have, typical. Uh, your partner is going to main control of the stretcher at all times. Because A power lift gate comes out. A stretcher is loaded. Wheels locked. Straps tied. It's secure. Take over. 
With this, first responders can move the patient who weighs up to 1,100 pounds in and out of the ambulance with ease. Lowering. Orange County fire officials say last year alone they transported more than 40,000 people to local hospitals. Of those patients, about 30% were obese and a few handfuls weighed more than 500 pounds. Because in the past you'd have to get five, six, seven firefighters uh, to physically lift the patient in. Increases the chance that something could happen to the patient. Also greatly increases oh, the no. incidence of back injuries uh, within the fire service. Ready? Okay. The cost, $23,000, just for the lift gate and the stretcher, but the convenience and safety features worth every penny. Now, officials say it'll take just minutes to get the patient ready for transport. With some of these morbidly obese patients, we have to send more firefighters just to lift and to move the patient. And then once they're into the rescue, someone has to be at the hospital to unload them. So that's pulling a lot of resources away from emergency calls um, just to do that. So this would allow essentially a, a two or three person operation to load and unload the patient. Bariatric 1 is assigned to station 73, but it will be used in other jurisdictions when the calls come in. It went on its first call Tuesday and firefighters say it was a big success. From Orange County, I'm Natalie Tolomeo, News 13. As she identified her son, Trayvon Martin, as the person who was screaming on the background of the 911 call, a crucial day for the state, that testimony right there, because uh, initially she's really just pointing out who she believes is the aggressor in this case, that being uh, George Zimmerman, as her son Trayvon Martin was the one she says was screaming for help. Listen to some of that exchange while she was on the stand today. You certainly had to hope that that was your son screaming even before you heard it, correct? I didn't hope for anything. Mm -hmm. I just simply listened to the tape. Mm -hmm. Now the defense there was really trying to suggest that uh, family members, relatives, even Tracy Martin, Sabrina Fulton's ex-husband, Trayvon Martin's dad, had all influenced Sabrina Fulton in believing that, yes, that was Trayvon Martin. So that was some of that exchange you just heard there with defense attorney Mark O'Meara as he was asking her questions, trying to uh, really see how sure she was that it was her son on that tape, Al. All right, you had some testimony that uh, somebody I had never seen before, which is uh, Javaris Fulton, who is Trayvon Martin's older brother. You're exactly right. He's four and a half years older than Trayvon. He testified today. The state called him up right after his mom, uh, Sabrina Fulton, testified. Now, when prosecutors were speaking with him, he says he was 100% confident that that was his brother on the tape. So listen to some of that exchange as uh, Assistant State Attorney John Guy was interviewing this brother on the stand. And do you recognize any voices on that tape? Yes. Whose voice do you recognize? My brother. Trayvon's? Yes. What parts of the recording do you recognize as your brother's voice? The yelling and the screaming. <clears throat> Had you ever heard Trayvon Martin yell or scream as the two of you were growing up? I've heard him yell, but not like that, but yes. Now, what also was interesting about the brother's testimony today was the fact that uh, when defense attorney Mark O'Meara got up there to cross-examine him, he pointed out that after the shooting happened, after this 911 call came out, the brother gave an interview to a reporter in Miami, and during that interview, he said that he wasn't really sure that it was his brother, Trayvon Martin, so some interesting interaction as there as well. We'll have to wait and see if the defense recalls this brother to the stand as a witness for the defense and if they'll in fact play that interview for the jury to hear al yeah and you also have tracy martin who originally said we're talking about the uh, his father who originally said that that wasn't trayvon on the tape so uh, i mean this jury has got a lot to absorb you're right, and it would be interesting if, in fact, the state did call Tracy Martin to the stand because, as you mentioned, uh, when he first was speaking with investigators just days after the shooting, really, they played that 911 call for him to listen to. Initially, he said, no, that was not his son. It was not Trayvon Martin screaming on the tape. Later on, he changed his story and said, yeah, that it was him. So we'll have to wait and see if the state calls him at all or if the defense will call him, too, as a witness for their case. 
Yeah, and then you have the FBI expert who said that only people that knew these people would know their screams, but in his testimony, he also hinted that you would have to know what both of the screams sound like to determine whether which one is which. And I would imagine the defense is going to bring up some of, uh, uh, of uh, George's family to say that was him screaming. Absolutely. I mean, we already know that George Zimmerman's uh, parents, his wife, they are on the witness list. So, yeah, they, there's a pretty good chance the defense will call them up to say, yes, that was George Zimmerman screaming on the tape. Have to wait and see. You know, the, the state still has this case. I mean, there's a chance that they will rest their case sometime today. So once the defense starts calling its own witnesses, most likely we will hear from George Zimmerman's family members to say, yes, that was George on that tape. And then you have Dr. Bio. Boy, talk about interesting. This is a guy that is so afraid of perjuring himself that he didn't, didn't seem to want to answer a lot of questions. And then he was taking, reading off of his notes to remember what happened during the autopsy because he testified he couldn't remember anything. And that's why we're in this big limbo. The, uh, the prosecution, you know, you're wondering why did they not know that he was going to be talking from notes? But anyway, he talks about the pain that Trayvon Martin may have gone through. Tell us about that. You're exactly right. He testified that he believed that Trayvon Martin was alive between one and 10 minutes after he was shot. He also said that uh, because of the type of gunshot went right to his heart, no one would have survived that. Uh, now, when he did testify about uh, what he believes Trayvon Martin was going through, the defense objected. Let's listen to that right now.